Hello everyone. So let me explain you about all about vitamin A today. So I'll be uh, briefly explaining all the high yield points about vitamin A. So vitamin A, it there are three forms. So one is retinol, that is uh, retinol, alcohol form of vitamin A is retinol, and then we have aldehyde form of vitamin A, and that is retinol dehyde, which we call, which we, we can write it as retinol. An A L, and then we have acidic form of vitamin A, and that is retinoic acid. So these are the three forms of vitamin A. We have retinol alcohol, retinol dehyde, retinoic acid. Retinol alcohol form can be oxidized into retinol dehyde. Retinol dehyde can be oxidized into retinoic acid. Now it all depends on which uh, which cell has got this vitamin A. So, if ovary or spermatozoa, so the like reproductive organs, so they need alcohol form of vitamin A. So, for reproduction, we need alcohol form of vitamin A that is retinol. Then for vision, we need aldehyde form of vitamin A and that is retinol dehyde, retinol. And then for cell growth and differentiation, cell growth differentiation and also for immunity, immune mechanism, we need a retinoic acid form. Okay. So now let me explain you how exactly we get vitamin A from the food. So we have two sources for vitamin A. One is the plant source. In the plant source, we get it as beta carotene. So beta carotene, we write beta carotene here, beta carotene. So beta carotene we get from uh, foods which are colored, especially like papaya, mangoes, so or the carrot. So any colored food which has carotene in that, so has got some amount of beta carotene and one beta carotene is a plant source now. Now animal source we get in the form of retinyl esters. So retinyl esters, so the animal source we get retinyl esters, this is the vitamin A for from coming from the animal source. Retinyl ester is basically it is a retinol plus fatty acid attached. Okay. So beta carotene or retinyl ester in the intestine, what happens is retinyl ester in the intestine is broken down into retinol plus fatty acid and they are absorbed. Whereas in the intestine beta carotene it is absorbed as beta carotene with scavenger receptor B class. Once beta carotene is inside, it will be clipped into two molecules of retinaldehyde by 15-15 dioxygenase enzyme. Now, whereas retinol which is absorbed inside the enterocyte, it will be combined again with the fatty acid to become retinyl ester. So whether it is beta carotene or retinyl ester, so ultimately in the enterocyte, they will be converted into retinyl esters only. Now, how exactly absorption of these molecules like retinyl ester or the fatty acids are going on? It will be with the help of micelles. So, bile acids and bile salts, they will coat lipids. As such, they will coat fat soluble vitamins. So, thereby micelles are absorbed. Basically, they help in the absorption of lipids and fat soluble vitamins. Once these fat soluble vitamins are inside, lipids are inside, they will undergo further processing. So, retinyl ester or beta carotene inside will be converted into retinyl ester and then it will be loaded down to a protein called apolipoprotein B48. So apo B48 and this apolipoprotein B48 it is there in the enterocyte it will be loaded with fat soluble vitamins, lipids and that will make chylomicrons. Apolipoprotein B48 will make chylomicrons and these chylomicrons are relatively bigger in size, so they will be transported to the lymphatics and from lymphatics they will find their way into systemic circulation and ultimately they will be going into liver. So this is how your vitamin A, it will go from intestine to the liver in the form of chylomicrons. Now, when the chylomicron is taken up by the liver, so all the contents are offloaded, it means your retinyl ester is offloaded in the liver and retinyl ester is stored in the liver. So 90% of our vitamin A, it is stored in the liver in the form of retinyl ester. Whenever body needs vitamin A, 
constantly this retinoyl ester is broken down into retinol that is alcohol form of vitamin A and that will be released into the blood and retinol in the blood it will be combining with a protein called RBP retinol binding protein. This retinol binding protein is synthesized in the liver and it's going to bind with retinol and it will be a transport form of vitamin A. Only thing is the molecular weight of this complex it is relatively lower so it can be filtered by the glomerulus that is why another protein called transthyretin transthyretin is going to bind to this complex thereby it prevents filtration by the glomerulus. Now whichever the tissue in the peripheral cells needs this vitamin A so they will express vitamin A receptors and they are going to internalize vitamin A that is retinol in the form of retinol. Consider your reproductive organs uh, needs vitamin A so they will take retinol and that will participate in reproduction. Whereas if uh, rod cells that is retina if it takes vitamin A so retinol that is coming from retinol binding protein it will be released as it will it has to be converted into retinaldehyde and that retinaldehyde will participate in vision cycle. Now, if your cell, uh, like you no know, peripheral epithelial cells takes it or immune cells takes it, so your retinol has to be converted to retinaldehyde, retinaldehyde further converted into retinoic acid and that will participate in immunological mechanism. Now, another thing that you need to remember here is retinoic acid, it acts like a steroid hormone. It means retinoic acid gets into the cytoplasm and inside the cytoplasm or in the nucleus, it will go and bind to a nuclear receptor. There are two kinds of nuclear receptor, one is RXR receptor and RAR receptor. The RXR receptor, it will interact with 9 cis retinoic acid whereas RAR receptor, it can interact with any kinds of retinoic acid. So whether it is RXR or RAR, so there must be dimerization of these uh, nuclear receptors by binding to vitamin A that is retinoic acid and then they will interact with RARE that is retinoic acid response element. So dimerized receptors interacting with retinoic acid response element they will recruit all the transcription factors and that is how the transcription of uh, that particular DNA segment will go on and will release mRNA messenger RNA and that can undergo translation and will it can change cellular physiology that means cell growth and differentiation. Uh, controlling of the keratin, controlling the cell proliferation, all the things are it can in, uh, alter the inflammatory process and also participating in the immune mechanism that can all be done by retinoic acid. Okay, So that is how the retinoic acid works. RXR has been uh, noted to be uh, having association with PPAR, peroxisome proliferated activated receptor and thereby it will help in maintaining insulin sensitivity. With this fact, so nowadays, uh, now they so certain drugs are under clinical trials which are referred as RXR agonists, so which are shown to improve insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetes patients. Okay, that's about uh, retinoic acid. Now, retinaldehyde. Retinaldehyde in the photoreceptor rod cells, so in the form of 11 cis retinaldehyde, you know, 11 cis retinol, so it can combine with opsin to make rhodopsin. So whenever light falls onto rhodopsin, so rhodopsin bleaches. When the rhodopsin is bleached, it means opsin is separated from all trans retinaldehyde and there will be neuronal signaling going on. How exactly neuronal, neuronal signaling will go on? So it all depends on, so when the light falls onto rhodopsin, so rhodopsin bleaching occurs, so this will, this conformational change will change in the conformation of a protein, associated protein called transducin. Transducin is a G protein, so this G protein has alpha, beta and gamma subunits, so because of the conformational change, alpha is now taking up GTP, beta gammas are separated. Now alpha subunit bound with GTP, it will go and activate cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase enzyme and this cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase, it is going to decrease the concentration of cyclic GMP in the photoreceptor cells. And because of this what happens, there will be closure of sodium influx channel. When the sodium influx channel is closed, so there will be decrease in the sodium concentration. It means positive charges decreased and that can lead to hyperpolarization of photoreceptor cells from minus 30 millivolts to minus 35 millivolts. Because of this hyperpolarization what happens, 
voltage gated sodium uh, calcium channels they will close and the calcium channel closes so there will be drop in the calcium levels and that leads to decrease in the release of glutamate into bipolar cell junction so glutamate here is an inhibitor in neurotransmitter so when the inhibitor in neurotransmitter concentration is decreased in the neuronal junction so that means inhibition is taken out and that leads to flow of information or the optic signals will reach from rod cells to the bipolar cells and from there all the way down to optic center so optic nerve and it will reach optic center and that makes vision possible under dim light so this is what is in short in brief about a vision cycle which is made possible because of sufficient concentration of retinol that is retinoid now let's talk about little bit about deficiency manifestations of vitamin a vitamin a deficiency it can be noted initially as uh, in, um, decreased acuity to green uh, green light green color and this can further lead to increase in dark adaptation time and it can uh, further lead to uh, bl night blindness and also uh, that's all because of the retinoid head which is decreased there uh, so now the retinoic acid is also decreased in vitamin A deficiency that means epithelial cell maintenance is also decreased it means conjunctiva becomes dry giving rise to conjunctival xerosis and corneal epithelium becomes so soft which we call it as keratomalacia and because of this softening of corneas there can be ulceration in the cornea and this ulcer eventually it will heal but the problem with this is it can lead to fibrosis and uh, cornea can become opaque and opaque cornea won't be able to transmit light to the retina so that's how there can be blindness in children having vitamin A deficiency and also since retinoic acid levels will be down so cell growth and proliferation is affected here keratin content will be affected so there can be increase in keratin content in the cell especially on the skin surface and that can give rise to hyperkeratinization and goose flesh appearance or the frog or toad skin appearance in vitamin A deficiency it can affect immune mechanism because retinoic acid will be down so that's why children with vitamin A deficiency they can have increased susceptibility for infection like our respiratory tract infection or viral infection having frequent like you no know, uh, susceptible for measles mumps rubella or the patients uh, may have di uh, diarrhea dysentery so that can increase the mortality or the mor mortality and morbidity rates in uh, vitamins uh, ch children having vitamin A deficiency and also it can lead to blindness in children so millions of children they are blind because of vitamin A deficiency across the world now that's about vitamin A deficiency now let's talk a little bit about vitamin A toxicity so vitamin A toxicity can be grouped into acute toxicity or chronic toxicity vitamin A toxicity you don't see just uh, happening because of consumption of normal food that we are taking so vitamin A toxicity can be seen only if there is a supplementation of extra vitamin A beyond our needs and also if you consume any food which has excess vitamin A like eating polar bear liver which has 6000 international units of vitamin A per gram and that kind of issues can put a person at risk of vitamin A deficiency in acute vitamin A deficiency so patient will have increased in severe increase in intracranial pressure giving rise to severe headache vertigo diplopia nausea and vomiting kind of signs and symptoms can be seen and in chronic uh, vitamin A toxicity similar signs and symptoms can be seen but much more than what we have seen in the acute toxicity only thing is severe is severity is not as that when you see in acute so in chronic toxicity is because of the supplementation of vitamin A like uh, 150 mg of vitamin A per day in adults or 60 mg of vitamin per day in children more than uh, like you no know, going on for months together that can put a risk of, a risk of chronic tox vitamin A toxicity in them so here patients may have uh, pseudo tumor cerebri something called a pseudo tumor cerebri where there is increase in intracranial pressure and signs and symptoms mimics uh, something like per, maybe per, like kind of person is having a tumor in the brain so although they don't they won't be having tumor it is all because of increased intracranial pressure and that's because of increased uh, vitamin A toxicity there and also patients may have bone demineralization bone pain 
and uh, so many other kinds of signs and symptoms like headache, vertigo, diplopia, so which we have seen in uh, acute toxicity can also be seen here in chronic toxicity. So in, in that sense, deficiency of vitamin A uh, can lead to signs and symptoms. Uh, equally, uh, toxicity of vitamin A can also give rise to uh, different signs and symptoms. So this is all in brief about vitamin A toxicity. I hope this brief review has helped you to know all the high yield points related with vitamin A. Thanks for watching.